Hi, everyone, and welcome. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Laura, and today's webinar topic is Realizing an Emissions-Free World, brought to you by Audubon Connecticut and Audubon New York in collaboration with our local Audubon chapter network. Our presenter today is Dr. Shandu Vishveshwaraya. Shandu works in the renewable energy space, is a former IBM fellow, and is the founder of a community-based nonprofit, Cure 100. Today, Shandu will walk us through climate science and the dangers of allowing warming to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius, concrete pathways for bird and nature lovers to limit global warming, and local and personal ways to address the climate crisis. This webinar is being recorded and live streamed on Facebook. It will be available afterward on our YouTube page, our website, and on Facebook. Questions are welcome in the chat box at any time, and at the end of the presentation, we'll have a question and answer session with our expert. With that, and with one more reminder that this will be recorded, I'll pass the mic over to our presenter. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to Audubon Society for this kind invitation to speak, and thank you, Laura, for your introduction. This award-winning photograph by David Slows that you're seeing shows the Eastern Bluebird, which is unfortunately experiencing measurable shifts in its winter and breeding ranges due to climate change. So let me ask a rhetorical question. What has this thing of beauty done to deserve the misery we're inflicting upon it? Speaking of things of beauty, this is our common home, a beautiful blue marble. As the t-shirts say, we have no planet B. So how do we save this one and only planet Earth? In a theme that I will hark back to over and over again in this presentation, this is a matter of personal responsibility. Let me start with a quote. I think that the only way to prevent the radical alteration of our planet is to commit to a radical alteration of our own behavior. So this is all about what we can do in our own lives. Today's presentation has three parts. We'll first understand the problem of climate change and then talk about the imperative of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade and then conclude with a remedy that I will argue is within our grasp. So let's first understand the nature of the problem. The sun, of course, is the source of all energy on Earth. It shines its rays at us, and some of the energy is absorbed by the Earth. The rest is reflected back into the atmosphere, shown by the thin blue membrane in the slide. Greenhouse gases in the atmosphere act like a one-way mirror and reflect some of that infrared energy back towards the Earth, thus trapping heat. Over the years, the Earth gets warmer, it really is just that simple. Let's blow your mind with a couple of numbers. How many pounds of anthropogenic or human produced greenhouse gases are emitted across the globe annually? Might it be 100 pounds? More. Might it be 100,000? More. Might it be 100 million pounds? more. Might it be 100 billion? More. Might it be 100 trillion pounds? Yes, that is close to the answer. 100 trillion pounds, which is 50 billion metric tons or 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions. Does anyone have any doubt that we are addicted to fossil fuels? Here's the second question. How much subsidy does the fossil fuel industry receive from governments all over the world per minute, every minute of every day? Might it be a dollar a minute? Might it be $10? Might it be a hundred? Might it be a thousand? Might it be 10,000? Might it be a hundred thousand? Might it be a million? You would not be correct. Might it be $10 million every minute of every day? That is the right answer. That works out to $5.3 trillion of subsidies annually. 
So the real problem we have is that the skies have become our open sewers without limit. Our story begins in the year 802,000 BC. That's the period of time for which we have reasonably accurate carbon measurements in the atmosphere. On the horizontal axis of this graph, you see the year starting from 802,000 BC, and we'll take a little journey all the way through today. On the vertical axis, you see the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in parts per million. Carbon in the atmosphere has been between 180 and 280 parts per million practically forever, except for the very recent past. Let's take a look and journey through time. We're now passing through hundreds of thousands of years, an unimaginably long time. Carbon is pretty much between 180 and 280, with natural variations from things like volcanic interruption, uh, eruptions. And whoa, as we approach 0 BC, we start to see something strange, and carbon is shooting upwards. So let's zoom in and see why that line is literally off the charts. Wow. In a split second of geological time, carbon has gone up to about 415 parts per million. Calpurnia, what have we done? We've truly messed this one up. So let's zoom all the way out so that we can see 800,000 years of history on one single chart. And you see the natural variations between 180 and 280, and you see this sudden burst up to 415 parts per million, most of which occurred after World War II. So let's zoom in on that recent increase of carbon in the atmosphere. In this chart, we will explore the interconnectedness of carbon emissions, carbon in the atmosphere, and global warming. On the horizontal axis, you have the year from 1850 to the present. And on the vertical axis, you have the number of billions of tons or gigatons of carbon emissions. Courtesy of the PIK data from Climate Watch, this is the total greenhouse gas emissions from 1850 until today. In the year 1850, the emissions were less than one gigaton or one billion tons. And today we have exceeded 50 gigatons. We've grown by a factor of more than 50 during this period. Nature can only handle so much CO2 in the atmosphere. So naturally, we would expect the concentration of CO2 to increase dramatically during this period. And that's exactly what we see in this aqua colored line. The concentration of CO2 starts at about 280 parts per million. The vertical axis is on the right hand side. And then in the present day, it's 415 parts per million. It's gone up dramatically blowing past the sustainable limit of 350 parts per million. By the way, some of you may not be aware, but the environmental organization 350.org is named for this carbon dioxide limit. As the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere went up, let's take a look at what happened to the temperature across the globe. Global warming is shown in red with a little bit of shading around the chart to show the uncertainty in the measurements. So why is this wiggling up and down and up and down? Well, these are natural year-to-year -year variations, so-called El Nino and La Nina years, and other reasons due to which you get natural variations. Nonetheless, it is very clear that there is a rapid, steady, inexorable upward march of global mean temperatures. And the total warming to date is 1.1 degrees centigrade. And if you look at that red curve, 
most of that warming pretty much happened starting World War II and up to today. So we have already warmed this planet by an average of 1.1 degrees centigrade. So where do all these greenhouse gases come from? No surprise, nearly 75 to 80 percent of greenhouse gases comes from our energy use in industry, in transport, in buildings, and so on. About 20 or 22 percent comes from a folu and waste. A folu stands for agriculture, forestry, and land use, and then there's 3.2 percent from waste. And where does all this extra heat go? It turns out that 92 percent of the extra heat from global warming goes into the oceans. And a lot of that warming is particularly intense at higher latitudes near the poles, as shown in this 2019 Berkeley Earth data. Which allows me to make a very important point. Global warming is not anecdotal. It is not warming in a particular year or a particular place or a particularly warm or cold weekend. It is instead the inexorable, steady, upward trend of the average global temperature across the entire Earth. Now, all of this extra heat in the oceans has a profound effect on the way our Earth works. The warm water at the poles causes the ice caps to melt. Warmer water expands. As a result, we get sea level rise. Water is warmer on average. The air is warmer. Warmer air holds more moisture. The ocean currents change. And all of this leads to extreme weather events like heat waves, droughts, fires, and hurricanes. So let's take a look at the environmental impacts from global warming. Depicted here on a map of the globe are some environmental tipping points. It's very important for us to understand what a tipping point is. In plain language, it means that we are tempting fate, that there is a very real chance that these environmental catastrophes will gallop away out of our control. To help you make sense of this chart, I've classified some of these threats for you. Let's start with the collapsing coral reefs, especially the warm water coral reefs off the coast of Australia. The extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere gets absorbed into the oceans. It forms carbonic acid. It increases the acidity of the oceans, which ends up bleaching the coral reefs thereby destroying a very important element of the aquatic food chain. Of course, there's melting ice, not just in the Arctic and the Antarctic, but in Greenland and also in the Himalayas, for example. Forests are getting destroyed. This is a matter of great concern, particularly to this audience. And you see the Amazon rainforest, the Canadian boreal forests, and the ones in Russia where the forests are shrinking and human activities are not helping either. Clearly, the habitats of birds and animals get hugely endangered, to say nothing of the global, global warming impacts that you get from dying forests. One of the most profound changes due to climate change is in the oceans. Here, I've circled off a number of changes that we are seeing in the oceans of the world. For example, you see the El Nino Southern Oscillation uh, in the Pacific Ocean. You see the Atlantic Ocean getting anoxic or having less oxygen and therefore less able to support marine life. You see methane hydrates in the Sea of Japan and so on and so forth. So we are really tempting fate in terms of a variety of environmental catastrophes. And we'll first look at some of the more obvious dangers from climate change, and then look at some of the dangers that we might not have considered thus far. Here's a picture of Hurricane Sandy close to home. This is actually a picture of the yacht club at Croke Non Hudson in the village where I live. And where that person is standing used to be the parking lot. 
you see how much of sea level rise and storm surge occurred for this to happen. It's just unheard of. Here's what a highway looked like in Houston during Hurricane Harvey. And the devastating bushfires in Australia, which have killed hundreds of millions of animals and destroyed nearly 20% of their forest lands. By the way, the main cause of the Australian fires has been traced to drought conditions due to the so-called IOD or Indian Ocean Dipole effect again showing us that it's changes in the ocean that cause the most profound changes in our weather and climate patterns. And much closer to home, the West Coast forest fires this year. Let me summarize this section and before we go on to the next one. We are simply emitting too much. We're treating the skies as our open sewers. We're subsidizing fossil fuels. We're subsidizing the poison. This is leading to too much carbon in the atmosphere. We have already warmed 1.1 degrees centigrade. We haven't yet bent the carbon curve. It continues to increase. This causes not only sea level rise and extreme weather events, but all kinds of dangerous environmental tipping points. And I know what you're saying at this point. Stop, I can't take more. Tell me, what should we do about this? So in this next section, let's understand the imperative to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. We've already warmed 1.1 degrees centigrade. So everybody understands we have relatively short period of time to make a difference. And I will argue that this decade will be absolutely critical. Now, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, is the United Nations body in charge of studying climate change. And as such, they are the gold standard of top international scientists coming together, doing research, and informing us of their conclusions. They have been crystal clear on this topic. We must limit warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Let me start this section with a quote from the IPCC special report. It says, limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade requires rapid, far-reaching, and unprecedented changes in all aspects of society. By the end of this talk, I want each of us to look deep into ourselves and ask ourselves, what am I doing that is rapid? What am I doing that is far reaching? And what am I doing that is unprecedented? So let's understand the main message from the IPCC special report. This graph tries to summarize the 700 page IPCC report for you with one simple picture. In this graph, the vertical axis shows the amount of global warming. And the horizontal axis is the year from 1960 to the end of the 21st century. So far, we have warmed up about 1.1 degrees centigrade, as mentioned earlier. Business as usual takes us to 2 degrees centigrade and beyond at a shocking pace. The IPCC has clearly told us that we need to limit warming to 1.5 degrees in order to avoid permanent, dire, irreversible damage to our environment. In that report, anything beyond 1.5 degrees is called overshoot. The scientists have plotted a course for us. They call these pathways. They have been very, very clear that we have to bend this curve. And they have given us a prescriptive way of bending that curve. The very simple takeaway from that prescription is as follows. We have to cut our CO2 emissions in half by the end of the decade, and we have to achieve net zero by 2040. Let me repeat that, cut in half by the end of the decade and net zero by 2040. Now, carbon dioxide that we emit stays in the atmosphere for a long time. In other words, Today, we are booking tickets for an environmental horror show 
that will occur towards the end of the century. This is the time for us to make a change if we are to stave off the worst effects of climate change. And that's a very clear point in the IPCC special report that we have no wiggle room. Oh my God, that looks so cute. Do that again, no wiggle room. We've got to get started right away. If you look at all the possible outcomes from different emission patterns going into the future, on this graph, you realize the urgency of what we have to do. On the vertical axis, you have the annual global greenhouse gas emissions. Today, we are at 50 billion tons or 50 gigatons. And on the horizontal axis, you have year until the end of the century. Business as usual is the upper plume where you have no climate policies. You continue to be addicted to fossil fuels. The parts per million of carbon dioxide will almost triple compared to pre-industrial levels. And we get a shocking amount of warming beyond four degrees centigrade. Current policies that countries and municipalities and utilities have announced uh, keep the emissions roughly stable at 50 gigatons. And we end up with approximately 560 parts per million of carbon dioxide by the end of the century and about three degrees centigrade of warming. Recent progress in the science has narrowed the ranges on all of these predictions. If all the companies and states keep their pledges and targets, then we reduce that warming a little bit to about two and a half degrees. And then we have the Paris Accord, which is pathways to get us to two degrees. And then you have the IPCC special report pathways, which says we have to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. And what's very, very clear from this chart is that if you look at the year 2030, if we need to be on a path to 1.5 degrees, we have to cut emissions in half to about 25 billion tons per year by the year 2030. Now, what's the big difference between 1.5 degrees of warming and two degrees of warming? I'd like to address this topic very carefully. The simple answer to that question is, we are playing a high stakes roulette with environmental tipping points. The IPCC report shows the probability of catastrophe in many different categories of environmental harm as a function of the amount of global warming. In this chart, we are looking at the bleaching of warm water corals, ice in the Arctic region surviving, and coastal flooding. And on the vertical axis, you have the amount of global warming. Remember, we've already warmed 1.1 degrees. If you look at the warm water corals, the intensity of the color, by the way, tells us what level of risk we're taking. So at 1.1 degrees, we're already taking a significant risk with warm water corals. And the amount of damage and the probability of damage just gets worse and darker at 1.5 and even worse and even darker at 2.0. What about Arctic summer ice? Well, at 1.5 degrees, it turns out that we will have an ice-free Arctic summer approximately once per century, once per century. At two degrees, however, we will have an ice-free Arctic summer once per decade. That's the kind of tipping point we're talking about. And likewise with coastal flooding. So I would like to ask everybody in the audience, who here would like to take the two degree risks if we can possibly limit warming to 1.5 and improve our odds? This, by the way, was exactly the spirit of a brilliant Audubon study called Survival by Degrees. Let's take a quick look at that next. What Audubon did was to study the breeding range and habitat of many species of birds in this study called survival by degrees. Here I'm using the bubble link as an example, but you can go to their website and put in your own favorite bird and see the results 
of the study. So if you look out your window and you enjoy the Cardinals, the Blue Jays, the Finches, uh, you can go put them in and see what climate change is going to do to those birds. So back to the bobolink uh, example. Here what you see is the breeding range and the winter range uh, for 1.5 degrees of warming. The red color indicating the reduction of that range in the northern parts of America and the southern parts of Canada. At 2 degrees centigrade and 3 degrees of warming, we make their ranges more and more threatened. So this is really a question of survival by degrees, a question of increasingly dire probabilities of doing permanent damage, whether it's damage to coral reefs, damage to species, damage to habitats, damage to low-lying coastal flooding areas, mangroves, uh, disease, on and on. All of these are a question of degree and the risks get bigger the more the warming that we cause. So let me try to illustrate this a little bit. Um, and I'd like to really zoom in on the difference between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. Because you have people who say, yeah, we've started decarbonizing. We'll get there. We need governments to do more. We need utilities to do more. I'm just going to wait around. Uh, and I really want to dramatize the difference between 2 degrees of warming and 1.5 degrees of warming. And I'm going to do this using a game that I made up that's called the Wheel of Misfortune. So how does that work? Let's have a little bit of fun with this. So here we have two wheels. Now, again, this is for illustration purposes, but we have a 1.5 degree Wheel of Misfortune on the left and a 2 degree Wheel of Misfortune on the right. Like the real Wheel of Fortune, there are some sectors where you get good results and every now and then you lose a turn or you get some sort of environmental disaster like the corals getting bleached or some species of birds going extinct, etc. So let's go ahead and give the 1.5 degree wheel a spin and see what happens. Oh, look, the sea level rise wasn't as high as we thought it might be. We got away with it. That's awesome. Let's give it another big, vigorous spin and see what happens. Oh, Arctic summer ice was preserved. Isn't that great? Awesome. Give it another spin. See what happens. Well, the coral reefs were saved from the worst damage. Now we all understand it's, this is simplistic. We also understand it's not binary, that coral reefs are either saved or not saved. But we do understand that at 1.5 degrees, we have a wheel we're playing with with odds that are favorable to us, with relatively small probabilities of the worst disaster. And even if they were to occur, the extent of it would not be as bad. Now, of course, you've been observing the two degree wheel of fortune or wheel of misfortune, where the odds are stacked against us. And well, let's give that a spin. And not surprisingly, your favorite bird species just went extinct. Sorry, give it another spin and see what happens. Oh my goodness, goodbye Miami Beach, goodbye Venice, Nauru, Marshall Islands, low-lying lands. Give it another spin, see what happens. Oh, we're going to have ice-free summers in the Arctic almost every year because we even exceeded the two degrees of warming. Well, I say spin, baby, spin. Every time we increase our CO2 emissions, we are going from the wheel on the left to the wheel on the right. We are taking the 1.5 degree wheel for ourselves and giving the two degree wheel to our grandchildren. We are sealing the fate of the risks that we will be taking for the rest of the century based on our behavior right now. It is a question of odds. It is a question of probabilities. And we are setting up a wheel that is stacked against us if we don't take action absolutely immediately. So now that I've thoroughly depressed you, let's get to the section we've all been waiting for, which is the remedy. All of what I've been saying thus far probably makes you feel a little hopeless and a little overwhelmed. 
And it's really led to a psychological phenomenon that now has a name. It's called eco-stress. And you can go to a clinician and seek treatment for eco-stress. And I would argue that the best treatment for eco-stress is to do something about it. In such times, I remember this quote that I really love. It is in those very moments when everything looks hopeless that we have a real chance to grow into something better. What the caterpillar calls the end of the world, we call a butterfly. We have the solutions. We have the knowledge. All we need is the will to change. That will to change is our butterfly. So allow me to talk for a minute about a not-for-profit on whose board I serve and who is trying to popularize the seven-step remedy that I will be discussing next. The will to change is manifested for us in a not-for-profit on which we're working very hard called CURE 100, which stands for Communities United to Reduce Emissions 100%. So briefly, Cure 100 is a not-for-profit. It is a consortium of communities that uses grassroots methods to decarbonize. The 100 in our name refers to the fact that we are targeting 100% of the emissions. And we would like to influence 100% of the people and businesses in our communities. And that we will achieve our goals through public-private partnerships working closely with municipal conservation and sustainability committees. So our goal is very simple. We have a baseline carbon, which is how much we're emitting today in 2020. We follow the IPCC goals of cutting in half by 2030 and achieving net zero by 2040. So this is a long-term 20 year mission to take 20 steps of 5% reduction per year. This is all about carbon reduction. And I would ask you a question. If reducing carbon is our singular goal, do we not need to know the baseline number in 2020? We have good news for you on that. Let me illustrate the importance of having a yardstick or a measuring stick for carbon. If you were obese, but didn't know your weight and didn't even have a way of measuring it. Could you really solve the problem? If you had diabetes, uh, you have to constantly measure, monitor your blood sugar. If you had to live within a budget, but couldn't tell a dollar bill from a hundred dollar bill, could you manage that budget? Well, if climate change is the compelling challenge of our times, how can we not know our own carbon impact? In fact, how can we not know one ton of carbon from 10, from 100, from a million? If we don't have a currency for carbon in which we are fluent, we will never succeed in systematically decarbonizing. As part of Cure 100, we have developed a piece of software, which is an app called the Carbon Tracker. It is available to all of you for free at the web address shown in this chart. The way it works is that you would first register, which you can either do with your Google credentials or create a user ID and password, and then fill in a simple questionnaire on what cars you drive, what kind of furnace you have, how much electricity you use per year, etc. And what you get back is a personalized carbon footprint that looks a little bit like the bar graph that you're seeing. You can understand your total household carbon emissions per year. You can understand how that compares to the average in your zip code and how much of that total carbon is due to transportation, heating, electricity, food, etc. So it is fully quantified to give you the information you need to make a plan to decarbonize. It is a forward looking piece of software because it gives you information and tips on how you can decarbonize in a systematic way. In fact, amazingly, we have found low hanging fruit of two to three tons per person 
amongst those who have used the app so far this year. And this is a scalable and replicable tool, and it works across all 40,000 zip codes across the country. And this is available to you to understand your own baseline carbon footprint. Now, once you understand your baseline, the Carbon Tracker app gives us a seven-step program to decarbonize. If each of us could follow these steps and get them done in the next 20 years, the problem will be solved. For illustration here, we will use numbers for an average American who has an annual carbon impact of between 16 and 17 metric tons per year. And in the East Coast where I live, the average is much more like 20 tons per person. So we have to reduce 20 tons in 20 years, so we better get after it and start reducing at least one ton per year. Step one in this seven step program is to attack electricity. And this is an easy one. There are four easy ways to completely zero out your carbon impact from electricity. A, you could sign up for a clean energy service company or ESCO. B, you could sign up for your own solar panels. C, you could sign up for community solar. D, your municipality or village could sign up for a community choice aggregation so that you group by clean energy for the entire village or the town. And between these four, it is simple and easy to do to just get that blue bar of electricity out of there and make that zero. Step two is to attack transportation. Now, these big steps are not really big steps. Each of them in turn has its own step down, so we can take little steps on the way to achieving a zero or negative carbon lifestyle. So let's take a quick look at the step down for transportation. The average large SUV or truck creates about eight tons of emission per year. Moving to a sedan or a family car cuts that in half to about four tons per year. A hybrid, which gives you about 50 miles to the gallon, further cuts that down. A plug-in hybrid uh, is a great compromise because typically the first 30 miles are purely electric and then it switches over to a hybrid mode. So you can get an equivalent over 100 miles per gallon with no range anxiety. So if anyone in the audience who has regular car needs is getting less than 100 miles per gallon, you need to ask yourself why I can easily get to at least that level. And of course, the last rung of the ladder is to get to a fully electric vehicle, and we need to get there fast, and the vehicles are getting better, cheaper, year over year. In fact, there are 43 models of electric vehicles on the market. All of them are listed on our website. Let me point out that every step down this ladder reduces emissions, reduces our total cost of ownership, and improves health because the particulate emission in the air also gets reduced as we decarbonize. So back to our seven step program, step three is to attack building heat. Again, this has its own mini step down chart. Let's take a look. Oil is the least efficient way of heating your home and the average home has nearly six tons of carbon impact from an oil furnace. Now, a very easy thing to do is to switch to biodiesel 20%. It's the same oil, but 20% bio sources for the diesel. And that saves approximately a ton per house. Easy and quick thing to do. Natural gas burns cleaner. Propane is even more efficient. And the ultimate rung of the journey is the efficient electric solution of heat pumps which are clean, efficient, and work really well. Now, that would be the end of the story, except I have to say something more about natural gas. The gas distribution system has inevitable leaks. 
Unburned methane is a dangerous greenhouse gas that is 80 times as potent as CO2 in a 20 year period in terms of its heat trapping index. And thus, inevitable leaks in the gas system completely nullify the benefits of clean burning gas. So to all attendees, I will say, gas is really a bridge to nowhere. Renewable energy is already here. We don't need stepping stones. New gas infrastructure has no place in our neighborhoods or anywhere else. And as before, every step down this ladder reduces emissions, saves money, and improves our health. It turns out that homes that have heat pumps have less carbon monoxide and less particulate emission indoors within the house. Back to our seven step program, step four is to go after food and waste. Let's take a look at that step down. When we talk about food, the single best thing we can do is to stop wasting food. Plan your meals, plan your shopping and reduce waste. Believe it or not, we waste about 30% of all food in the United States. Our diets also matter. As you can see in this chart, a big red meat eater has about 3.3 tons of annual CO2 impact, taking into account the full supply chain of all the food. Being an average meat eater reduces that impact. Being a non-beef eater further reduces it. Vegetarians are at about 1.7 tons and vegans at 1.5 tons. Now, of course, we will never reduce this impact all the way to zero, but every bit makes a difference. Meatless Mondays, anyone? How about vegan Wednesdays? How about just focusing on food waste and reducing it? Let's talk about waste. Oh, did I mention that every step down the ladder reduces emissions, saves money, and improves health, none more so than diet? The next pillar is waste. Any trash we produce gets carted in a diesel belching truck to an incinerator that produces more emissions. Anything we can do to reduce waste helps the environment. The average household has about 0.8 tons of impact from waste. By recycling paper, metal cans, plastic, glass, composting, we can reduce the impact to under half a ton. And again, the step down helps the environment saves the community money and improves health. Back to our master plan. Step five is to decarbonize our goods and services. Here, the most important thing we can do is to buy local, buy goods with less packaging, invest our money in mutual funds and other investments that have high ESG scores, environmental, social, and governance scores divest our 401ks from fossil fuel investments. Step six in the master plan is to reduce zip code overhead. What is zip code overhead? It represents all the public services, municipal buildings, train stations, schools, retail, houses of worship, and so on, all the public services. What we need to do is to aggressively work with them to get them to adopt a seven step program of their own so that they decarbonize at the same pace because we require that 5% per year across the board. The last step in all of this is offsets. Now, I've lived a journey of decarbonizing. You can get down to single digit number of tons quite easily, but to truly get to zero or negative, you need to offset some of the last bit of carbon. And what does that mean? It means managing forests better, planting trees, investing in greenery, or buying offsets uh, that you can do anytime that you fly on a plane, for example, and that money is used to reduce greenhouse gases of an equivalent amount somewhere else in the world. So with these step-down charts, I hope I have convinced you that if everybody on this call and everybody on this earth simply follows the seven-step program, 
we will be at net zero in 20 years. And it doesn't matter what the government does, and it doesn't matter what they don't do. It doesn't matter what the utility does or doesn't do. We should not be asking others to do more, although I hope they will. We need to take things into our own hands, adopt a seven step program and work our way down this ladder, get healthier, save money and save the environment. So let me end my talk then with a call to action. Number one, please use our carbon tracker to determine your household carbon impact. And please be kind, this is new software. If anything can be better or anything breaks, please let us know and we will take care of it right away. Second, please take our pledge to decarbonize at cure100.org slash pledge. Please do some simple things to get your carbon impact down. Get your electricity to be zero carbon, that's easy. Sign up for biodiesel if you have an oil furnace. Get a free energy audit of your home or swap out your bulbs for LEDs. Just eliminate food waste. Rethink your diet in small ways. Start planning for your next car or your next furnace. Those are the big ticket items. Three, urge your community to join us at Cure 100. Cure 100 is a consortium of communities and we have campaigns for each of the seven steps in the seven step program that we can share with you. And you can try to do these same campaigns in your town or your village and there's really strength in numbers if we can all get together, agree on a common mission and go after it. Join us, make a contribution if you can, become a volunteer if you can, start your own chapter of Cure 100 if you can. And at this point, I really wanna thank uh, the Audubon Society for a financial contribution that they have made uh, to Cure 100. Let me end with one last quote. As Gandhi said, be the change that you want to see in the world. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to stop the program there um, for tonight, but I do have a couple of other things that I do want to share with you. Um, we, as a chapter for National Audubon, um, or for Delaware at Seagull Audubon, let me rephrase that. Um, we, as a chapter, um, have made steps to make the carbon tracker available as one of those um, community groups. So I do want to, let me go back to sharing my screen. Um, with the information um, from our website. So um, at our website, on our homepage, uh, you'll see some general information. You'll also see upcoming programs here. This is this evening's um, climate tracker training. Um, we've added this mechanism and subscribed as a community organization with Cure 100. So we can help our community go in and set up uh, to track their carbon within their own um, region. So basically that's gonna happen um, on December 17th. There's information here on our website. I'll share a little bit more there. Um, but we've also added this little C button in the header section for the carbon tracker. And you can go to that link um, and learn about the carbon tracker. And if you sign up on our page, your, your carbon uh, differences will be tracked over time through our community. Um, we will have access to summary data. So it will tell us, you know, like of the people in our community who are participating, how much carbon has been reduced and we can get some measurable data and impact from that. Um, so basically on our website, uh, doas.us slash carbon tracker, or you can just click this green button here. We'll give you an introduction and an overview to it, what you need to have uh, available in order to do it, and then launching the app. 
And then if you need support and you're not quite sure, um, I am scheduling time on Thursdays where I can work with people one-to-one -one and you just have to schedule an appointment for that. Um, I do want to mention also that the climate program that we have begun to work on to some degree, um, we're really just starting, is to try to initiate some action within our chapter region. So uh, we are looking for people who might want to do something in their communities, um, who might want to talk to their neighbors. Projects can be anything from letter writing campaigns um, to working with their municipalities on climate smart communities steps and, and getting further down that pathway. Um, it could be for native plant programs, maybe a municipal you know, area that a uh, pollinator garden or native plant garden um, can, can go as both an education tool and a habitat piece. Um, and other action steps um, for climate, including like reducing carbon emissions and maybe just trainings on how to, you know, how to talk to people about climate change, because that can certainly uh, be somewhat controversial. It was amusing because we tried to advertise this program on Facebook and they immediately shut us down and wouldn't allow us to post an ad for this webinar because they saw it as environmental politics, which went against their current rules and regulations. So it was really a struggle um, to try to create the ad that did not say climate change in any of the text and still be accurate to what we were trying to promote. Um, so we use, you know, reducing your carbon footprint um, because that worked. <laughs> but it, it, it is really, for some reason, um, seen as a controversial, very political topic um, when really it's, it's our environmental future and an extremely important piece um, of our, you know, what we, what we will impact um, from here. So as part of the program, um, we have also added um, in our header section, a link to our new network. I'm just gonna click that link here. And we've set this up as a space where our uh, participants, people who are interested in joining us, we can have a space that's associated with our website, um, but still separate where we can have group conversations. And I know um, we do have a couple of people here in tonight who've already joined us. I'll send links and an invitation, but our group in this network for climate action is for sharing of resources um, and kind of developing a network of people where we can have some discussions. Um, I'll go through if I find webinars or presentations that might be applicable to climate topics. Um, we can post information here and then get into deeper information about you know, electricity conversations, transportation, heating and cooling. So each of those seven steps kind of can be addressed here in their own topic and we can have discussions, learn from each other and support. And then if we have projects, people who are in some of our communities who want to work together and, and put a project together that we can help either provide some starting funds to get something off the ground if it requires expenses or help to identify grant sources and maybe partner as part of a project to just help um, strengthen the success. So I'll have information and a follow-up email um, to everybody here um, tonight and people who registered but not, might not have been able to make it for um, learning more about that and joining us in that network where we really hope to do some great things and take, you know, taking action now is gonna be so important um, as I think was really highlighted in this evening's presentation. So, that is pretty much it for this evening. Um, I hope that it was 
a program that can inspire us uh, towards action. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, you can email me through the DOAS email, which is info at doas.us. Um, and I will get that message there. Um, I'll also be sending an email out to everybody with some of the information. We'll have the webinar linked if you wanna share it. Um, we did record live on Facebook. So I believe that went as a live stream video, which hopefully we were able to reach some more people through that and continue to do so. So um, come to the training on the climate tracker. Put January 5th on your calendar for a follow-up presentation with panelists. Um, we've got probably seven or eight really good people, uh, local expertise and some regional expertise on each of those step-down areas, electric, home heating, um, goods and services, solid waste, um, shop local, all, all of that. So thank you again, and I'm going to say good night from here, and feel free to email me your questions. <laughs>